all of us know that one day Messiah will come and the third temple will be built. In Jerusalem, Jewish exiles from Babylon rebuilt the temple, which stood for many more centuries. It's been ages of rivalry over the Temple Mount, and all eyes are now on the Dome of Rock as its safety is threatened again. The Israelites have not stopped wailing about their temple foundation being under the Dome of Rock, and now something shocking has just happened to the Dome. Why is the rivalry over the Temple Mount so strong? Why are all eyes fixed on the Dome of Rock, and how long would it last? Let's find out. Nothing had prepared the world for the tension about to unfold on the Temple Mount in April this year during Ramadan. According to reports, Palestine worshippers had thrown stones at Israeli worshippers at the Western Wall, leading to Israeli police officers attacking the Palestine worshippers in the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. The raid was a long one, as it lasted throughout the night until the morning, with the Palestinians being pushed out of the compound. According to the report, about 12 Palestinians had been injured, with three taken to the hospital. But why all this tension? The raid began with masked people locking themselves inside the mosque with fireworks, sticks and stones as weapons as they intended to spend the night in the Dome of Rock, which was against the rules. When the police arrived, these weapons were soon released on them, leading to the violence which later ensued. Sadly, one Israeli police officer was injured in the process. Indeed, so many questions have evolved from this incident, so it will do us some good to take a closer look at the event. What is the tension between the Jews and Palestinians over the Temple Mount about? As scary as this sounds, there is nothing new about the recent incident in the Dome of Rock, as there have been more brutal ones in the past, even leading to loss of lives and mass arrests. But whether or not the event is new, the fundamental reason for this tension remains baffling even to those who know the story. For many years, Jerusalem as a whole has been a spot for the immense rivalry between the Israelites, the Jordanians, and the Palestinians, with the focal point being on the Temple Mount, as the Jews call it, or the Al-Aqsa compound, as the Muslims call it. Today, the Muslims stand at a high vantage point as the Al-Aqsa compound occupies a large area of Jerusalem, standing on the highest elevation of the land with the Muslims in control. But this is a relatively new development. To the Muslims, Jerusalem remains their third holiest site after Mecca and Medina. But interestingly, the sacredness of this city had begun long before the arrival of the Muslims. It all began with King David taking the city and making it his capital city in 1000 BCE. Following this, King Solomon, David's son, soon built a temple on the Temple Mount, making the city the holiest of all cities for the Israelites. The first temple in Jerusalem, often referred to as Solomon's Temple, was built in the 10th century BCE by King Solomon. It served as the central place of worship for the Israelites and housed the Ark of the Covenant. The construction took seven years, but the Babylonians later destroyed it in 586 BCE as part of the Babylonian exile. Following this, the second temple, also known as Herod's Temple, was constructed in the 6th century BCE after the Babylonian exile. It was expanded and renovated by King Herod the Great in the 1st century BCE, becoming a grand and significant religious center. But this temple was again later destroyed by the Romans in 70 CE during the First Jewish-Roman War. To the Israelites and Jews, the fact that the Temple Mount remains non-negotiable as the location of the First and Second Temple only meant one thing. It spoke volumes about where a third temple must be constructed. Following this, there have been plans to build the third temple to restore Israel to the right order. However, because the third temple has to be built in the same location as the first and second temple, no progress has been made. This is because the Al-Aqsa compound now occupies the Temple Mount. But how did this come to be in the first place? As it turns out, after the Romans took over Jerusalem, a city called Aelia Capitolina was built, and there was no room for Judaism to thrive in it. Thus, with Constantino the Great, who was the then ruler of the Roman Empire, becoming a Christian, Aelia Capitolina was highly Christianized. Following this Christianization, the spot in Jerusalem where it is believed that Jesus was crucified, 
buried and resurrected was soon occupied by the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The city's Christianization continued until the 7th century, and at this time, it was full of churches, monasteries, and hospices. In 614 CE, the Persian Empire under King Khosrow II captured Jerusalem and held it for about 15 years. The city's Christian population suffered during this time, and many Christian buildings were damaged. However, in 629 CE, the Byzantine Empire under Emperor Heraclius recaptured Jerusalem from the Persians, but it was soon time for the Muslims to take over. In 638 CE, Arab Muslim forces led by Caliph Umar ibn al-Khattab captured Jerusalem peacefully. The Arab Muslim rule marked the beginning of Islamic control over the city. Under Islamic rule, Jerusalem retained significance as an important religious and cultural center. However, there were few changes in power after this. In 1099, during the First Crusade, European crusaders captured Jerusalem and established the Kingdom of Jerusalem. The city changed hands multiple times during the Crusader period, before Saladin, a Kurdish Muslim leader, recaptured it from the Crusaders in 1187. The Ayyubids ruled the city, and later the Mamluks. In 1517, under Sultan Selim I, the Ottoman Empire took control of Jerusalem and held it until the end of World War I. After World War I, Jerusalem came under British control as part of the League of Nations mandate for Palestine which lasted from 1920 to 1948. However, in 1948, the State of Israel was established, and Jerusalem became its capital. This led to significant conflict and disputes over the city's status, which continue to this day. As it turns out, since the time of the Arab rule over Jerusalem, Islam has taken root in the land. This was the period wherein Islamic structures like the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque were built. Today, the presence of these structures in Jerusalem remains protected by the Palestinian government, which still considers Jerusalem its third holiest site. The Jews, however, seem to be bent on reclaiming the Temple Mount to build their third temple, and recently, the Dome of the Rock seems threatened. So, how close to destruction could the Dome of Rock be? For those who do not know this structure, the Dome of the Rock remains a very important monument to the Palestinian government. And not only that. The Dome of Rock is also one of the world's most iconic and historically significant Islamic architectural structures. It was constructed by the Umayyad Caliph Abd al-Malik between 685 and 691 CE and stood as one of the earliest major works of Islamic architecture. Of course, the very spot where the dome stands bears great significance in Islam. The significant events associated with the spot where the Dome of the Rock was built include the night journey and ascension to heaven of the Islamic tradition also known as Isra and Miraj. According to Islamic belief, this is the event where the Prophet Muhammad is said to have been miraculously transported from the Kaaba in Mecca to the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, and from there he ascended to the heavens. The rock at the center of the Dome of the Rock is believed to be where the Prophet Muhammad began his miraculous night journey. This event is of immense religious importance to Muslims and is recounted in Islamic tradition. The Dome of the Rock was constructed to commemorate and mark this event, making it one of the holiest sites in Islam. Today, the Dome of Rock gracefully stands on a raised platform with a stunning blend of Byzantine, Persian, and Islamic architectural elements. The building is primarily octagonal, with each side facing one of the cardinal directions. This geometric design is symbolic in Islamic culture, representing paradise. The most striking feature is the golden dome, covered in gold leaf. The dome's interior features a wooden structure adorned with a mosaic of intricate geometric patterns and Quranic inscriptions. The exterior of the dome is covered with vibrant blue tiles, forming intricate geometric and floral patterns. These tiles, known as faience, are a defining characteristic of Islamic architecture and contrast stunningly with the Go Goldenome. Quranic verses and Arabic calligraphy are prominently featured on the building, both inside and outside, beautifully executed in various styles. These inscriptions convey religious significance and provide an element of artistic decoration. The structure is surrounded by a series of columns and arcades, with each column topped by unique and ornate capitals. 
These support the outer wall and create a visually appealing transition between the lower and upper parts of the building. The walls are constructed from a combination of different types of stone, including marble and colored stones, arranged in geometric patterns and decorative bands. This use of various materials and colors adds depth to the architecture. The interior features intricate mosaic work with a rich color palette. The mosaics depict many motifs, from floral designs to arabesques and calligraphy, creating a visually immersive experience. The building is constructed over the large rock, traditionally believed to be where the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven during the night journey. This rock is visible through a small hole in the floor of the building and is enclosed by a metal grate. But here is the catch. Other than the fact that the dome commemorates the ascension of Prophet Muhammad, no one knows the real purpose of the dome. The dome is not a mosque, judging from its building style. Hence, has led to a series of debates over its true purpose. Some scholars argue that the construction of the Dome of the Rock by the Umayyad Caliph Abd al-Malik had political and symbolic motives. It was a way to establish the presence and significance of Islam in Jerusalem, especially in competition with Christianity and Judaism. The building's architectural and decorative elements have also been debated. The use of intricate mosaics and inscriptions, some referencing Islamic beliefs and others not, has led to even more confusion. Some have concluded that the Dome of Rock was built as an alternative location to practice Hajj because of an event of rebellion in Mecca in the 8th century. During this time, rebels, led by an extremist group known as the Karajites, briefly seized control of Mecca. These rebels were dissatisfied with the rule of the Umayyad Caliphate and opposed what they perceived as unjust governance. This event is known as the Rebellion of Ibn al-Ashath and occurred in the late 8th century. The rebels, led by Ibn al-Ashath, captured Mecca in 747 CE. During their control of Mecca, they are said to have changed the rituals and practices associated with the Hajj pilgrimage. It's believed that these changes included the recitation of political slogans and anti-Umayyad messages during the pilgrimage. This historical incident was believed to have contributed to why the Dome of the Rock was built. However, it's important to note that this episode was a brief and tumultuous period in the history of Mecca, and it did not result in a permanent alteration of the Islamic pilgrimage or religious practices. The Hajj to Mecca remained the central and unaltered pilgrimage in Islam. Regardless of these speculations, the Dome of the Rock's architecture remains a testament to the skill and artistry of the craftsmen who worked on it and serves as a symbol of the cultural and religious heritage of the Islamic world. However, no one knows how long this structure may survive following the tension between the Jews and Palestinians. The Jews are particular about this dome and the Al-Aqsa Mosque as they sit over what is said to be the foundations of the first and second temple and hinder the building of the third, which is quite huge. The attempt to build this temple, by all means, has placed the Dome of Rock, as well as the Al-Aqsa Mosque, under numerous threats, as some even fear that the dome would be hit by an Israeli missile one of these days. Of course, this would mean war, as the Palestinian government would not fold its hands and watch the dome being destroyed. It gets more interesting as the Dome of Rock as well as the Al-Aqsa Mosque are not merely hindering the building of the Third Temple, but are believed to be standing in the way of ancient prophecies, which includes that of the abomination of desolation. What is this abomination of desolation, and how does it affect the world? You see, the building of the Third Temple is not just pushed forward by the human desire to have a place of worship, but is rather laden with the pressure that comes with the fulfillment of prophecy. According to prophecy, the third temple would be a precursor to the coming of the Messiah. Here, the Messiah is often called the Mashiach in Hebrew. He is believed to be a future savior or anointed one who is expected to fulfill several roles, including gathering the Jewish people from their diaspora and returning them to Israel. Following this, he would bring an era of worldwide peace where nations will no longer wage war and people will live in harmony. The Messiah will lead by example, promoting righteousness and adherence to God's laws. It's important to note that there is no consensus among Jewish denominations regarding the nature and arrival of the Messiah. Some Jews believe in a future, literal Messiah. In contrast, 
Others interpret the concept in symbolic or metaphorical ways, focusing on a messianic age rather than an individual messiah. Here it gets more interesting as the Christian who also believes in the coming of the messiah believes that he has already been revealed in the person of Jesus, who died and was resurrected to save mankind. Following this, Jesus ascended to heaven and is expected to return in immense power, shaking the world. This may sound interesting, but this is where the abomination of desolation comes in. According to the prophecies, after the third temple is built, the abomination of desolation must happen before the Messiah comes. The prophecy of the abomination of desolation is a term found in the Bible, specifically in the Old Testament book of Daniel and the New Testament books of Matthew and Mark. It is a prophetic concept with religious and historical significance in Jewish and Christian traditions. In Daniel 9.27 and Daniel 11.3, the abomination of desolation is associated with a future event in which a desecration or sacrilege would occur in the third temple in Jerusalem. The specific details of this event are a subject of debate, but it is generally seen as a symbol of religious defilement or persecution. In the New Testament, the concept is also referenced by Jesus in Matthew 24, 15, and Mark 13, 14. In these passages, Jesus speaks of the abomination of desolation as a sign of the coming end times. He warns of a future event when the abomination that causes desolation will stand in the holy place, which must happen before his return. However, the third temple had to be built before this abomination, believed to be the Antichrist, was revealed. Hence, even while the battle to build the third temple is on, there is also a need to expect this abomination of desolation to happen afterward. What can we say? As strange as it sounds, we can only wait for the first part of the prophecy to come to pass, which is the building of the third temple. After this, we will see what comes next. Thanks for watching till the end. What do you think about the threats on the Dome of Rock? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below.